Good morning and welcome to worship this morning in the middle of this summer. The heat wave has hit and we can really feel it, but we're glad you're here today. Home folks are here I see and some people that are visiting in town and we're glad you're here. And if you notice we have a special visitor today, Chris Sanders is here while Zach is on vacation. And Chris is from Louisville and he wears many hats. If you'll read uh, this, his bio in there, you'll enjoy knowing about him. He's gonna tell us about a lot of the hats he wears, but today he's our CBF Kentucky interim coordinator. So he's gonna talk to us a lot about what's going on in CBF Kentucky and in our, our place in CBF. And we are so glad to have him. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. And we're glad you're here. Will you stand and say hello to the people that are around you? Let's begin worship with a hymn of praise, number 437, How Wide the Love of Christ, and we'll stand as we sing together.
pray together. God of creation and of love that is wide and it's high and it's deep. We come this morning as crumbled and broken people and we want to praise you through that pain and that loss and also as we are searching for you. Give us hearts of praise. Give us hearts that long for your love and your peace to fill this world. Hear our prayers, hear our songs. They are a gift to you. And may we leave today with our spirits renewed and our hands and our feet prepared to serve you. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Will you read with me our litany of invitation and confession? God built the heavens, the earth, and everything in them. God calls us to be builders as well. God calls us to build our lives. To restore broken places and continue to grow. God calls us to build our faith. To study the scriptures and ponder their meaning. God calls us to build our community. To build bridges of understanding and systems of justice. God calls us to build history by living into God's image. To preach the good news of God's love and liberation. We hear this calling, and yet we don't always get it right. We ask for God's grace for those times when we fail, and we ask for the courage to follow Christ's example, and we lean on the Spirit to sustain us in the heavenly task. God's word does not come to condemn us, but to make us wise, reviving our souls and lifting up our hearts. God's word has been fulfilled among us in Jesus Christ, and it sets us free. We are forgiven, we are loved. Let us lift our voices in thanks and praise to God. And a word of illumination to open our first scripture this morning. The prophet Ezra summons God's people to obey God's law. So this reading from the book of Nehemiah. When the seventh month came and the people of Israel were settled in their towns, all the people gathered together in the area in front of the water gate. They asked Ezra the scribe to bring out the instruction scroll from Moses according to which the Lord had instructed Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the instruction before the assembly. This assembly was made up of both men and women and anyone who could understand what they heard. Facing the area in front of the water gate, he read it aloud from early morning until the middle of the day. He read it in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand and everyone listened attentively to the instruction scroll. Standing above all the people, Ezra the scribe opened the scroll in sight of all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while raising their hands. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read aloud from the scroll the instruction from God, explaining, interpreting it, so the people could understand what they heard. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep. They said this because all the people wept when they heard the words of the instruction. Go, eat rich food and drink something sweet. He said to them, and send portions of this to anyone who have nothing already. This day is holy to our Lord. Don't be sad, because the joy from the Lord 
is your strength. And here ends the first lesson. And so this morning, in your pastor's stead, as Christians all over the world gather on a Sunday morning, and as cooperative Baptists gather all across Kentucky, let's pray together. God, I thank you for the ministry of this church here in the middle of Middlesboro, the first Baptist church in this, in this community, gathered together. I thank you that they do not neglect nor forsake the meeting of mind and spirit. We thank you that it's not just this community that's scattered at this very moment, but that Christians all over America, all over North America, South America, East and West on the seven continents are gathered to worship, to learn, to be inspired, and to go forth in mission. So, in the stead of this pastor, I bring this pastoral prayer to all the folk gathered this morning, that all the needs of this community be met, that all the pains and aches and heartaches in this room be comforted, that all the concerns that we have for leadership, for governance, for inspiration be brought forward in this holy place, in this holy time. And so we pray together, just as you taught us to pray so long ago, praying as in, with one voice and one mind and with one, as one people all gathered around the world, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. response is number 652 in your hymnal, Make Me a Servant. Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee by reading from the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue, a reading from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue as he normally did and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from which the prophet Isaiah, from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor. 
to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him, and he began to explain to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. And here ends the gospel lesson. In our hymn of stewardship, a gospel song that we love, hymn number 576, I stand amazed in the presence. Will you stand as we sing together? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for the beauty of this day and our ability to comprehend that beauty. Lord, give us strength that we might overcome our weaknesses. Give us faith that we might overcome our fears. Heavenly Father, lead us to see the needs of others around us and then provide with us the means to alleviate those needs. Open our eyes, Father, that we might see truly the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. We give thanks this day for the privilege of bringing part of those blessings back to your house. In this and all things, we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, choir. If you're a regular here, a longtime member, by now you've noticed that I am not Zach Bay. <laughs> That's a good thing. Zach and Christy are away for some well-deserved rest and vacation and asked me to be here uh, during uh, their time away and during the interim. Uh, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship here in the state uh, is going through an interim time uh, with us on looking in a search for a permanent coordinator. And I'm the fill in until they get somebody good. <laughs> so I'll say some more about that search as we go. But I want to say thanks to First Middlesbrough for being such an important part of our state fellowship. It sounds like I'm just buttering you up for money, but I'm not. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, First Middlesboro is, is, is a vital and integral part to, of, of our fellowship all across the state. And I'll say more about that work as we go. Uh, it's just that sometimes people feel like on either end of our, you know, our wide commonwealth that you know, they can be out, outside and out, out of the loop. And I just want you to know that's not the way the churches of the fellowship feel. First Middlesboro is vital and important and central to what we do. Let me just tell you for a minute then, what's going on with the CBF here in Kentucky? Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, we're dozens of churches, thousands of Baptists all across our commonwealth, statewide. We're networked together in fellowship, trying to let the world know that there really are, well, there really are thinking and feeling and open-minded, open-hearted Baptists. Sometimes that feels a little hard to understand and in some of the sound that we hear out there in the world, but that Baptists are thinking, th feeling, healing, open-minded. We are related, our state fellowship, related to the National Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, some 2,000 churches, million people all across America, gathered uh, to do the work of mission and discipleship, uh, justice and integrity. We just got back a few of us from this congregation just got back from our national convention in Atlanta. Uh, John and Beth and their wonderful daughter, Sarah, I got to see again. Uh, to hear about the work of the fellowship, I just I want to tell you, if I don't tell you anything else, that the National Cooperative Baptist Fellowship is doing very, very well. There were some 1,500 of us all together What's expiring, especially when I get together in these events, is all the young people, young ministers, young lay people, with great plans for the future and a renewed commitment, a renewed commitment to missions. In missions, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, CBF for short, we work together in the U.S. and around the world. I want to say a word first about the Kentucky work around the world. We've taken responsibility in missions uh, for the nation of Morocco in North Africa. Our churches here have a partnership with some 10 churches there. Our state fellowship networks uh, with their convention, I'll try it in French, their native language, the Eglise Evangelique à Maroc. That's all the French I know, <laughs> so <laughs> that I do. <laughs> It's their convention and it's in partnership with us. That is our partnership really without borders. And here's what, if you don't know anything more about Morocco, I want you to know this. The church in Morocco, the Christian church in Morocco, Protestant church more specifically, is composed of graduate students. Morocco is an education hub for all of Africa especially those churches or those people who come from sub-Saharan Africa. They come to, to Morocco on the North Coast to do their graduate education. And so it's the graduate students that form the churches uh, in, in Morocco. They're, they are, if you will, the best and brightest of Africa who have come together to do their studies. It's those folks who lead the Christian churches in Morocco, which of course is a mostly Muslim country where due to some official tolerance, it's kind of okay to be a Christian. In reality, maybe not so much. So they take a chance in Christian faith, again, the best and brightest looking toward a future, to express themselves in Christian mission. 
and it's their mission work that is especially important to our mission work. You know, students, as, you, as, as any students I know here or have been students like me in the past, are about mission. Inspirable, lead folks who are, are led by the call of God. Their mission there, these graduate students in these churches, is amongst refugees. Refugees who are coming from sub-Saharan Africa to places like a forest called Ujda. Africa, Africa is really, really difficult, like you see on the news. Desperate people with nothing to live for if at home south of the Saharan desert, they walk away from civil war and from famine and disease in their home countries. They walk and walk and walk hundreds of miles across the desert. Who knows how many don't make it? I mean, I wonder how many don't make it. Because they're trying to get to Europe by going through Morocco to life and hope and promise there to work, to, to, uh, to meet their families. But they arrive in Morocco to find that Europe doesn't want them. And then when they get there in Morocco, they're stuck and they find out Morocco doesn't want them either. So there's really nothing to go home to back south of the Sahara, but Morocco pushes them around and pushes them out. So Kentucky Fellowship Baptists, in coordination with these graduate students in the churches there, are working in the forest refugee camps in Ushda to help the least of these God's children try to just try to survive. We work on the most basic human need, food, shelter, health care, of course. And Kentuckians, this is it's an opportunity for you and your congregation. Kentuckians have taken many trips to Morocco. In fact, I have a meeting tomorrow with our missionary, uh, Karen Thomas Smith, uh, coming from Morocco to, to the state. Mission, mission folk go from here to there frequently. And if that's not been a part of your life before, maybe you'd like to go with us next time. We're on mission, of course, here in Kentucky as well. I don't have to tell this congregation about Extreme Build, but I will anyway. We just finished building our 12th house in 12 years over in Mercury County, just a couple of hours away, bearing witness to Jesus' message to bring good news to the poor. It's part of the National Cooperative Baptist Fellowship campaign called Together for Hope. We bring good news to the poor in the 20, 20 poorest counties in, in America. Y'all know better than I do that three of those poorest counties are right here in, in Kentucky, especially in Appalachia. That's McCurry County, and it's why we need asset-based community development like uh, we do so well together. Now, this is before me. The interim started after the house was built, so I don't take any credit for building this house. But I've been there before. I know folks in this congregation know Extreme Build. And if you've worked on this house this year, or if you've worked on Extreme Build in the past, would you raise your hand, folks in the room? Wonderful. I know you'll want to talk to these folks if you've not been part of this before. Maybe you've given, maybe you've built. Uh, I know that you've been part of prayer support for Extreme Build. We built, just a month ago, a beautiful house for three folks living on the edge. I'll give you their names. Kimberly, Chloe, and Tasia. It's not tough as for them as it once was. They don't live on the edge like they did because they've got a good place to be in because we're there, you're there to bear witness and to make a difference, bearing witness. So the story goes that a man died and went to heaven. St. Peter meets him at the pearly gates, high and wide and says, look, young man, here's how it works. You need 100 points to get into heaven. You tell me all the good things you've done, and I give you a certain number of points for each one. When you reach 100 points, you get in. Man goes, well, okay. Uh, I was married for 50 years. Peter says, well, great, that's worth three points. Man's eyes get a little big, he goes, three points. Well, okay, uh, uh, I went to church all my life and I paid my tithe. Peter says, terrific. That's worth one point. Man's going, one, two, three, four. Okay, well, a man goes, well, look, last and best. I started a soup kitchen in my city. We gave out food to the homeless, and I worked in a shelter for homeless veterans. Peter goes, fantastic. That's two more points. 
He goes, well, <laughs> he's counting on his fingers and getting desperate. He goes, wait a minute. <laughs> at, this po- at this rate, I only got six. The only way I'm getting into heaven is by the grace of God. St. Peter goes, bingo. <laughs> 100 points for you. Come on in. You see, folks, as hard as it is to believe, it's not about how hard we try, it's not about how much we give, and it's not really about us. Now, I've lived long enough now, some of y'all have too, and I've finally become self-aware enough, 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 ask my wife, that I know it isn't about me. Becoming self-aware took way too long for me and maybe for you, but it's been well worth the wait because it's about God. It's about God's mercy, it's about God's grace, and we're accepted just as we are. I happen to be a lawyer. Forgive me, I'm a lawyer. For any of the lawyers in the room, you know it's only about grace. It's not about strings, caveats, whereases, the deals we make, no, chance, no last chances, not even contracts with God. It's just about the love of God, freely given. So grace... God's grace is given for us, for all who listen, who get it, who believe, and who accept. That's for all. I want to emphasize it again, all. Because, well, because since I travel around a lot for you, I need to bring you a word of warning. There's some out there in Kentucky now who are preaching what they call Calvinism. It isn't true Calvinism. I really doubt John Calvin would approve But they're saying that not all can answer the call. Not all who want to come to Jesus are welcome. They're only saying that a few, they call them the elect, will be saved. So that following Jesus and responding to God's call really doesn't make any difference. Because only those folks they call the elect will be welcome on that day. So, just a heads up. If you hear that word Calvinism... I want you to listen closely because it's become a big project to get Calvinism into churches like this one. Now, seriously, watch out. If what they're saying is Calvinism, I don't like it. I don't agree. I don't want it. And I'll never be a Calvinist. Because friends, the very essence of God's grace is that folks who are my age and older in this room, as you've known all along, Whosoever will may come. You don't have to accept it. God won't make you. But God never gives up on you and is always ready for you. That's who we are. We're there for grace, for freedom. What is it that makes us cooperative Baptists? In one word, freedom. That's freedom beyond patriotic freedom, separate from love of country. Fourth of July freedom, if you will. As great as that is. I'm talking about the four fragile freedoms that we Baptists understand and love. One, soul freedom. We have direct access to God. No church, no priest, no bishop stands between us and the Father. Two, church freedom. Our local congregations, autonomous, are free to make our own decisions. Three, religious freedom. A free church and a free state, separate from government, separate from partisan politics, That's what keeps our churches free. But finally, and most important, Bible freedom. Freedom to read and respect God's words for ourselves, individually, as people together, to know it, to love it, and to treasure it. So it's freedom and grace. Those two things together bring an amazing hope. When we know in our heart of hearts that we don't deserve God's love, God has made us free because God loves us, that's confidence. So I'm convinced that freedom and grace go together just like that. And we have hope. That's that hope I'd like to say a little more about. So Jesus is new to his call. He goes home, his home, Nazareth. Now, any of y'all who ever left home and then come home again, can kind of get the dynamic. Things have changed, and you've changed. Well, Jesus has changed. He's felt the call of God, and so he goes home, 
and he gets called to preach in his home synagogue, his little church. He calls for his Bible, which is the Hebrew book of Isaiah, calls for it and then reads. As it's repeated into the story we've heard this morning from the Gospel of Luke, and it repeats, bears repeating again, just these verses. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then Jesus began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So this is Jesus' first sermon, number one. We should take note of what people want to say first. Jesus is setting out his vision for the kingdom of God. Brian McLaren calls it the dream of God. By, now, by analogy, think Dr. Martin Luther King talk about how he has a dream. So it's a vision for a better tomorrow, for a brighter day on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus claims that with this reading, in that moment, the scripture has been fulfilled, that God's dream is real, and God's dream in his time is now, and in our time, now. It's at that point, I do a mental double take, because frankly, here on this Sunday, looking into Monday, these days look pretty much like the days before. It's hard to swallow that the dream of God has already come true. Just a couple of examples. One, we're painfully aware regularly that there, there's so much more that America has to do about race. I'm not gonna get too deep in the weeds here, but just to say that for my whole life, Americans have been divided and it just needs to stop. I do some work for a historically black college. I visit African-American churches, I visit white churches, and those churches, as you know, are segregated. On here, the most segregated morning in the whole country, in the whole time in America. That's just gotta change. Another example, in my work life, my life as a lawyer, I've been at this for over 25 years, approaching 30. I've seen the same crimes committed over and over, the same corporate greed and cheating, the same mean, dumb, senseless cruelty, and the rich getting richer at the expense of the poor. I personally represent dozens of victims of wage theft who are often the hardest working people, though they earn really very little, and then they take home even less when they get cheated, and that's, dis that's discouraging. So, Tomorrow will be better than today, better than yesterday. Every now and then, this is what the kingdom of God does. Not all the time, and you can't predict it. I can't predict it. The kingdom of God breaks through. The dream manifests itself as real in a moment because the power of hope is that change is both present and coming in the future. The kingdom of God, the dream, the dream, which is the year of the Lord's favor, it's also known as the Jubilee. You historians in the room know what I'm talking about. It's the Old Testament Jubilee plan for canceling crushing debt in order to allow people to start over fresh. It's a do-over. Jesus is calling for a massive do-over. That matters to folks who are deep, so deep in debt they can't get out. Victims of payday lending, for example, or maybe students in this congregation who are heavy laden with debt. Wouldn't it be amazing to have a do-over so that you can be, be free from, the, from that pressure, financial and otherwise? So the dream of God is that God is not done. We know it in the life and death and life again of Jesus. Jesus died and lives again. So death doesn't have the last word. Amen? Death doesn't have the last word, nor hate, nor ignorance, nor meanness, nor pride, nor scandal, nor power madness, and not even disease and decline. So in Jesus' life, we're all renewed, and there's hope for all of us. We can believe 
that building houses together, an extreme build, here in Appalachia is more than building just one house at a time for one family that re really needs it right now. It's much more than that. Because, and I'm not saying it's not enough because Kimberly and those kids really need it. But it's more than that. Those houses are beachheads in a huge struggle against poverty in Appalachia. And we're gonna keep on doing it. And you can be part of that again, year after year after year. So we can believe the Sunday morning today segregated doesn't have to be sun, Sunday morning seg segregated always. And our hope is renewed too, around the world. With the thoughts of the best and brightest of Africa, graduate students in Morocco are gathered, serving amongst the, amongst the least of these in Africa. And we get to help. There's a lot more. I haven't even told you about the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky's new president. I haven't talked to you much about Campbellsville. It was growing like a weed, Georgetown College, the work of Simmons College and St. Stephen Baptist in racial reconciliation. But I do want to leave you with this, where I began. The search is on for a new permanent coordinator to do what I'm doing right now, permanently. We need that person to take us to the next level. And there's a search committee. And I want you to pray as a congregation, pray for that search committee so that they'll lead us to the person that God has to lead us. So all those things I could say a lot more about, but I'll hold that for another day. Just know that there's so much that we as Cooperative Baptists do together and that more is on the way. Amen. So, the time's now. Just one more word of scripture to take us into this time of response. This is from the Apostle Peter's sermon. 17th chapter of Acts, 30th verse. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring that all people everywhere should repent. Peter's saying, look, now you know better, you have to choose. God gives us some room, you know, gives, gives us some room while we're ignorant. But once we know, once we've felt that sense of grace in our lives, once we've understood freedom, once we've felt hope, well, that, that demands a choice. And that time, sisters and brothers, is now, like this moment. It's not about guilt, really. It's not, not about guilt. Because I'm not saying that God's going to get you if you don't get it in gear. I'm not saying that at all. It's just that when you know, when you felt, it's rude to keep God waiting. So just right now, as we sing, it's your time. You can step forward, come to the front, and tell this church that you've made a choice. It's a choice to believe, to join, to respond to the call of God. And if you've heard that call of God, what's stopping you? Let's sing.
worship today. And thank you, Chris, for bringing words to us today. Will you greet him at the door as you leave, and he'll do our benediction. It's been wonderful to be with you in worship this morning. On behalf of all the cooperative Baptists around the state, greetings, and go in peace. Amen.